Hello, I'm Ingrid Farrow. I'm founding faculty at the Scandinavian School of Theology and also coordinator of the Master of Arts in Old Testament at Northern Seminary in the Chicagoland area in the US. Today, I would like to talk with you about a common misunderstanding that Christians have, and it's a misunderstanding about law and grace. This raises the question, is the God of the Old Testament the same as the God of the New Testament? This has been a problem and has caused Christians to ignore the Old Testament because they tend to think that the God of the Old Testament is angry, a God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is filled with grace. And they see this as a dichotomy, a split, that there's a difference, that somehow God changes between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Certainly, Jesus Christ, death, resurrection, and ascension is a completely new trajectory for us, but God is the same throughout all eternity. God's mission from the beginning before creation was to bring all people to himself. God has always been a God of grace. This did not change at the cross. This is who God is. So how did Christians get this wrong? Let's begin with the meaning of the word, the law, which of course is the English translation, but most Western translations include some concept of this. Now, when I'm teaching the Pentateuch, I will always ask the students, when you hear the word, the law, what do you think of? And generally the kinds of responses that I get are they picture a courtroom where there's a judge and the judge has a gavel and there's somebody that's on trial and there's a jury and either the person is guilty or innocent. And depending on the verdict, that will result in either prison or some kind of a fine or the person goes free. Other concepts when people hear the word the law, they think of a police officer pulling them over while they were driving their car because they broke some kind of a law or basically they think of the law as punishment or being released from punishment guilty or innocent but that is not the meaning of the word torah which is the hebrew word that became translated into law into our modern, most of our modern languages in the hebrew the word torah means comes from a word meaning a finger pointing the way. In other words, this is the way. It means instruction. Torah is also the root word where we get the word teacher from, even in modern Hebrew today. So a teacher, instruction, is something very different from a courtroom setting. This got modified a little bit when it was translated into the Greek, namas. Namas meaning also the law, can have more of a judicial kind of sense. But dealing with languages, we want to go back to what is the Hebrew meaning of the word Torah. So as an example, in Proverbs 1.8, uh, the scripture says, my son, do not ignore the instruction, or excuse me, do not ignore the discipline of your father or the instruction of your mother. And that word instruction is the Torah. So listen to the, the Torah of your mother. That's instruction. Now, some may have had a mother that really laid down the law, but again, here the word Torah means instruction. It's pointing the way. Which way should I go? I don't know. This is the way. That's what instructions do. So let's take a look more deeply to understand what is the Torah and how are we to understand it and how is that meaningful to us as Christians to see the Bible as one book, not as one divided between Old and New Testament. So historically in Protestantism, beginning especially around the time of the Reformation, um, the reformers came up with essentially three different ways to divide up the law when they were dealing with the Old Testament. And it was predominantly civil, ceremonial or ritual and moral. And the conclusion was that civil law that had to do with the nation of Israel. So laws having to do with the running of the nation of Israel or the running of society, we could really ignore as Christians. And then what about ceremonial or ritual? Well, they many of the people would say, well, it's ritual. So that also only applies to the priests and when they had the temple doesn't apply to us today. But the moral law, that's all that really applies to us today. But the problem with this traditional approach uh, 
which sees significant discontinuity between law and grace and between works and faith, is the difficulty of answering why God gave the law to the Jews in the first place. There's a wonderful book, which I would recommend, called Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus. It's written by three, uh, three scholars who are Messianic Jewish authors. And they bring up the point that the very first time that the word command is used in the Bible is in Genesis chapter two. So the first time God commanded, the Lord God commanded saying of all the trees in the garden, you shall eat freely. That's actually the first command commandment that was given. And the one after that was, but of the tree of the knowledge of evil, you shall not eat or you shall surely die. But the first command, look at everything that I've given you, the Lord God said, eat freely, enjoy. God had given us all that we need. And the second tree represents the two choices that all of us as humans have. Our choice from the beginning, even in the garden before there was sin, the choice was to either freely obey God and be thankful for all that he has given us or decide, nope, I want to be the judge myself of what is right and wrong. I don't want to have to rely on God, and I don't want to have to rely on what he has to say. I want to be God myself. Those are the two choices. But God knew even when the choices were that simple, he knew that the first humans could not obey and keep even that command. So why would we think that we could obey? Why would God think that we could obey 613 laws as the, the rabbis refer to the rest of the laws in the Pentateuch? It was always impossible. Salvation and relationship with God was always based on faith, which leads to grace. So traditional approaches, again, which regarded civil and ceremonial laws as essentially not applicable to Christians, uh, normally, the applicability of the so-called moral law is emphasized over the civil and especially the ceremonial laws. And some traditions believe that Jesus set a new moral code, which makes the Old Testament law obsolete, unless specifically quoted and explained in the New Testament. So these have been some of the main models. But there's a problem with that. When I've had students who tried to go through the law, separating into these three categories, Every one of them said, we can't make it work. It always falls apart somehow. Because the problem is that there's no place in the Old Testament or in the New Testament where such a distinction is made in this way and with such implications. Nowhere in scripture do we find these three categories. They are made up and they don't work. We need to shift our thinking about this subject away from the limit or the extent of application. In other words, which laws apply and which don't. Uh, to the level or kind of application. So in other words, the issue is not how much of the law applies, but how the law applies. So again, this is going to be a new concept for many people. So let me say it again, the issue is not how much of the law applies. In other words, which laws can we pick and say, this doesn't apply, this doesn't apply, but how do these laws apply? So that may sound confusing at first. So let me delve into that a little bit more deeply with you. First of all, in the ancient Near East, all ancient uh, nations and city-states and so forth had laws. Laws are just part of humanity trying to keep people and situations under control. But in all of the other nations outside of Israel, they would have these law codes written down in, in which it would say, for example, if this happens, then, then this is the result. If somebody does this, then do this. If somebody breaks this, repay them this amount and so forth. And they were just simply law codes. But the unique thing with scripture is in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, the law is embedded in story. It's embedded in narrative. It's surrounded by poems and itinerary uh, logs and conversations because the Old Testament law was never intended to function outside of a redemptive relationship with God, the God of covenant with which it is embedded. So in other words, God never intended any of these laws to apply outside of a covenantal relationship with God and also a covenantal relationship with people. It's not intended to work outside of that. So that is the first point. So again, also 
we have to take a look a little bit at an ancient cosmic worldview. So in the ancient Near East, while the legal collections were the work of kings, the law that they embodied and the justice that they sought to enforce were built into the cosmic system. So each of these ancient uh, lands also had ways of looking at how the world happened, how the world was created. And these laws are part of a reflection of their worldview the view of how did everything come into being. So in the rest of the ancient Near East, everything came into being through conflict and through fighting of the gods. But in scripture, we look at Genesis 1, there is no conflict. God is before the beginning. In the beginning, God already was. And God speaks what God thinks and speaks happens and God assessed it and it was good. Everything that God made was abundant and flourishing and good. So it is a reflection of who God is. And then it builds from there in Genesis 1 to the, the crown of creation, which is creating humanity, who God intended to represent him in the physical universe. And so everything flows out of that, that relationship, that kinship, that family relationship with God. And so it's the difference is, the laws in a house, if you have loving parents and you have a household that is run well, that's where everything is intended to be for the flourishing of everybody within the family, then there are instructions given. There are certain things that need to be done, certain things that need to happen, certain ways things need, need to go. But it comes out of a desire to see the flourishing of everybody in the family when it's a healthy family. And God being the perfect father, Everything that God intended, all of his instructions are intended for our flourishing and for the flourishing of his creation. So that is the perspective that we are intended to approach the law, the Torah, God's instructions. So ancient law codes were also guiding principles. They gave examples rather than complete descriptions of everything that was to be regulated. So ancient people were expected to be able to extrapolate from the sampling of laws uh, and what the laws said to the general behavior that the laws in their totality pointed toward. So in other words, even when you look at the, the Pentateuch, you can see that there are changes. Some of the laws change, even in the Ten Commandments, there are some of the commandments are expressed a little bit differently in Exodus 20 compared to in Deuteronomy 5. And that's because they are, even the Ten Commandments are providing guiding principles, again, instructions for godly living in this earth in relationship, right relationship with God, right relationship with each other, and right relationship with God's creation. So that is the perspective from the beginning that God wanted us to have as we read and listen to his instructions. So again, the covenantal basis for biblical laws. The biblical laws are not sufficiently comprehensive to serve as a legal foundation for administering a society. The intended function was covenantal. So again, the laws were intended to point us to right relating with God, one another, and the universe. So let's look at some uh, scripture to get a little bit better understanding of this as well. So again, the law is a shadow, an example of the heavenly. The law is a physical representation of spiritual truths. Let me say that last statement again. The law is a physical representation of spiritual truths. So for example, Colossians 2 verse 17 says that the law, uh, those things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So again, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So God's instructions are holy. His commandments are holy, righteous, and good. But although the law is good, let's look at some other passages in the New Testament. The law brings the knowledge of sin. That is an important first point. So when we read the laws, for example, don't eat of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, don't try to make decisions about what is right and wrong apart from God but make them in cooperation. But once you know that's an option, then you can say, well, now I have a choice to make. So the law brings choices. 
you can look and say, okay, this is in God's instruction. Do not commit adultery, for example, in the Ten Commandments. And someone may say, but I don't like that one. Now that I know that that's an option, some people are going to choose to go against that. So the law brings the knowledge of sin. And once you know that that something is clearly and some of them are clear, some are not so clear, and we'll talk about that later, but that some of God's instructions are, are clear, then you know that when you're breaking them, that is called sin. It is a departure from the instructions of God. Uh, it's, it, another term for that is a transgression. You've stepped over a line that God did not intend for you to step over. Also, although the law is good, it, it was, it is a legal guardian to lead people to Christ. Because when, when uh, well, for example, I have one friend, she was a Jewish friend, she came to Christ reading the book of Leviticus. Because when she read the book of Leviticus, she said she realized she could not live up to any of these as a Jewish person or as any person. She said it was just impossible. So it was a legal guardian that led her to Christ, to grace. The law is not a faith, and those who rely on it remain under a curse. The law gives power to sin, because sometimes once a person digs their heels in, says, I'm not going to do what God says, it can, it can actually empower their movement further away from God. It was given to increase transgression, because again, once you know something is out of bounds, you may want it more. So the more someone says, don't eat chocolate, don't eat chocolate, don't eat chocolate, the more you may want to eat chocolate. So it is good when used lawfully for instruction, reproof, correction, and guidance. Let's look at that last one a little bit more. So although the law is good, it is good when used lawfully. So the lawful use of the Torah is for, and here comes that word again, instruction, reproof, correction, guidance. This is what the Torah is to be used for. It's not to be used to bang people over the head or to bring harm to people or to stand in judgment and to feel superior to somebody else, but it is for instruction. And that is how we're to view the law in the Old Testament. That's how God always intended for the Torah to be used as his instruction that we are to help instruct others. So, but the Old Testament was not written to keep the New Testament believer under the law, under guilt or under condemnation. Rather, it was written by the prophets for us through the spirit of Christ that we would set our hope fully on grace. I'm gonna put up now a long verse from 1 Peter 1, uh, beginning in verse 10, but let me just read the first part. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. So let me take a moment on that. The prophets, so again, referring to the Old Testament prophets, and that includes Moses. Moses is called a prophet as well as all the rest of the prophets. Uh, they were prophesying about the grace that was to be ours, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them. So in other words, in the old, under the old covenant, in the Old Testament, the spirit of Christ was at work giving words of instruction. So again, we have to remember Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the Lord God. He became embodied as a human, but Christ himself is God. So the spirit of Christ was at work in the prophets, trying to show us and point people always from the beginning the way to have relationship with God. And so verse 13 at the bottom here, therefore preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again, this, he's talking to New Testament Greek believers. So still that revelation of Jesus Christ, we always need more of a revelation of who Jesus Christ is and the grace that he brings us. That just like with Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's always been the basis, faith, righteousness, grace. 
Jesus also taught accordingly absolutely no part of the Torah, the Old Testament law, has passed away even today. He says, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law. So in other words, the God's instructions are also, they continue, they, have, they do not disappear. So in reading the law in the Torah, the question again, and this is repeating what I said earlier, uh, the question is not whether or not the law applies to the Christian, but how does the law apply to Christians? So I'm going to give you one easy uh, example or easier example and a few other examples of how to apply the Torah. So easier to understand one is the one, for example, when Jesus was asked, Master, what is the most important law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, we know that Jesus says that all of the law, all of the Torah hang on these two. So all of the instructions, all of the rituals, all of the ceremonies, all of that hang on these two main laws, instructions, love God. And love is not just a mushy thing in, uh, in the Bible. Love is a covenant commitment. It's a commitment, it's faithfulness. Be faithful to God, cling to God, put God first with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. And out of that, because of your love for God, since God loves every human, love your neighbor as yourself. That's from Leviticus 19. And of course, some of the Pharisees asked, well, who, who is my neighbor? And remember the story Jesus gave of the, the Good Samaritan, uh, where Jesus concludes saying, everybody you pass by, everybody you encounter is your neighbor. And we are to help and care for and be good to everybody that we encounter all the rest of the law becomes fulfilled in those simple two instructions and commandments. But let's look at a couple more tricky ones, uh, examples of how to apply the Torah. So laws for being put outside the camp. So I've often heard uh, people talk about, oh, it was so mean, uh, just you know, touching a dead body and you're put in exile, you're put out of the camp. That's a misunderstanding as well. So within the camp and and, these were given originally while the people had they had left Egypt and during the Exodus and they were in the wilderness. And in the middle of the camp of all of the people was the tabernacle, the place of God's dwelling. And the tabernacle at night, there was a pillar of fire. Uh, and during the day, there would be a cloud covering it. God's presence was manifest in and through the tabernacle, which was in the middle of the whole camp of all the Israelites. But there was a place outside of the camp. It was not a place of exile uh, because these, these things, leprosy, touching a, a dead body and discharge of bodily fluids, these are all just normal parts of life. Leprosy was not the way we think of leprosy today. It was basically a skin condition where the skin would typically turn white and it was an infectious disease. But when the people were put outside of the camp, it wasn't as a punishment. It was because where the where God's presence was, only life was supposed to be there. It says in Exodus 15 that that there was no sickness and their clothes didn't even wear out. Where God's presence is, there is life. When we think of Jesus, who in John uh, chapter 1, verse 14 says that he tabernacled among us, uh, would, would be one of the translations. Jesus, he became flesh and tabernacled among us. And wherever Jesus went, he brought life. Jesus could not go to a funeral without raising some, someone from the dead. Anybody he touched or anybody who touched him would be healed. Uh, they would be cleansed. Unclean spirits would be cast out because God is life. He's the God of life. And within the camp, everything was life. Leprosy, the white skin has the appearance of death. Touching a dead body, that's pretty clear. It's, it's death. Uh, the discharge of body, bodily fluids, both blood and semen were considered life-giving. There was life in the blood. And so again, any of those things discharged or within the camp, the, being outside of the camp was simply a place to go to 
be cleansed again and return back into the camp. So again, it was not a punishment. And so we have to change some of our thinking about that. Uh, so another example, uh, and these, you know, I used to think were very strange, especially uh, the law do not kick, uh, do not cook a baby goat, a kid goat in its mother's milk. Uh, until I read the other one in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 22 that says, uh, do not take both a mother bird and her eggs for food. But this passage in Deuteronomy 22 ends by saying, so that you may live long upon the land. And that bears an extremely close resemblance to the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long upon the land. So I came to realize that even in our food source, we are supposed to show honor to life. So in other words, if you take if you cook a baby goat in its mother's milk, there's a kind of dishonoring of the mother goat uh, and not taking both a mother bird and her eggs. It's, it's taking both a mother and, and the child. And so even in our food source, we're supposed to be respectful of life. And that's why we have so many laws now that talk about ethically um, trying to eliminate pain in animals and trying to give animals a good life, even when they're going to be our food source ethical treatment, because the, the things that we see and the way we treat and think about even our food source has an impact on the way we think and can have an impact on the way we treat other humans as well as God's creation. So God wants us in all of our decisions to be respectful of life and to recognize, uh, treat life with, with honor and uh, so that we may live long, long upon the land was the promise that goes with that. So again, these the law here, they're not just weird or arbitrary. They're helping us, again, give physical representations of spiritual realities. How do we think of life in general? Do we honor life? Do we respect life? Do we honor mothers and fathers and so forth? So even in our food sources, we are to consider that. And then this one had really stumped me. I was uh, doing my readings. I, I came to the book of Numbers, chapter 28, and I was reading the morning and the evening sacrifice that was required of all the people. And as I was reading through it, I thought, you know, Lord, I always want to be consistent. And the things that I'm teaching my students, I want to make sure that I'm living up to as well. So I read every morning and every evening they were to offer sacrifice a lamb. And then they were to also put have a sacrifice of fine flour from grain mixed with beaten oil and a drink offering of wine before the Lord. And I thought, OK, Lord, help me to understand to see how do I, how does this law apply to me as a New Testament believer, because that's what I teach. So as I prayed about it and took some time and thought about it, the Lord brought to my remembrance Romans chapter 12 that tells us to, to offer our lives, our bodies as a living sacrifice before the Lord, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I can prove what is the good, acceptable, and, and just will of God, a perfect will of God. So as I thought of that, I thought, and it actually changed the way I open my mornings and close my evenings. So in the morning, I see both, first of all, Christ, who gave his life for me, as the Lamb of God. And then I take my life and see myself as a living sacrifice that I place before the Lord every morning and every evening. And then the fine flour, grain, grain had to be picked and then it had to be pounded out and everything. So the grain in the ancient Near East, 70 to 75% of their food was from grain. And so every day they would have to take these, these uh, grain seeds and then grind them out. So it represents the work of my hands. So I think, Lord, every day that which I'm beating out in life to do my work, Lord, I offer that before you every morning. And at the end of the day, Lord, may the work that I did today be pleasing in your sight. And I offer that as a sacrifice before the Lord. And then oil was something they would put on their face, on their skin to uh, make it a little shiny, to keep it from drying out. And so again, it was something for their health, for their well-being. And Lord, may what I do with my body for the well-being of my body, may that also be pleasing in your sight. And the drink offering that, you know, that was for joy. So for example, um, 
in the Passover, they've got the cups of wine and so forth. And so, Lord, may may my joy, even my entertainment, may the things that I do for fun, so to speak, may those also be pleasing in your sight today and at the end of the day as well. So, Lord, have my, take myself, take my work, take my body, and take the joy of the joys of life, and may they all be pleasing before you. And so again, the Lord keeps giving me insight how even ceremonial and ritual law can have spiritual applications and personal applications to us. And so I continue to gain and glean more and more love for God's instructions and understand ways to apply them. So this uh, concludes my presentation today. I pray that the Lord may show you more and more delight in him, that you may love the instructions of God. And as you read God's word, to not take it as a gavel, not take it as God trying to pound you down, or and not to use God's word to beat other people, but rather to recognize God's mission from the beginning is to draw all people to himself from every country, everybody, to draw people to himself, to find him, the God who is good, the God who loves us, the God who has given his own life for us, that we might be in fellowship with him. Thank you very much, and God bless you.